Firstly, good evening, doctors, and uh, welcome to our HealthBridge Clinical uh, webinar. Um, thank you very much for making the time this evening uh, to join us. I'd like to start by introducing um, the three panelists. My name is Yvonne. I I'm at work at HealthBridge. I'm an executive overseeing the um, product and uh, marketing portfolio. I'm Jared. I also work at HealthBridge. I'm the head of products in the clinical space. Um, I've worked there collectively for about 15 years. Showing your age. My name is, my name is um, Daniel Israel. I'm a GP. I don't work at HealthBridge, um, but I am quite fond of HealthBridge and I've worked with HealthBridge a bit. Um, I'm completely independent um, and I've utilized a lot of HealthBridge products and have had the privilege of doing so. Great, thanks. Um, so from our side, we're very excited um, to share our new electronic medical um, record um, with you, which we've called um, HealthBridge Clinical. And really, um, how a lot of our doctors are really starting to benefit from um, digitizing their, their patient files. And the product was designed, co-designed with the team of doctors. And Dr. Israel was, was part of that team that helped us design the product. And, and really, the reason why we worked with, with doctors was to ensure that the product worked in a way that worked in a way that doctors wanted to work and that it didn't get in the way of the very valuable patient um, doctor relationship. I think one of the things you'll see when Jared demos the product is really just how simple and easy it is to use um, during um, consultation, which is something that the team um, kept very, very dear to, to their heart in when designing the product. And um, you'll see you'll see just how how quick and easy it is in fact um, to to use. Before I ask Dr. Israel to share how he's managed to run a, a very successful fully digital practice for, for a number of years, um, let me just take you through some logistics. So unfortunately, we're, we're not able to see or, or hear you this evening, um, but we'd still love to, to get questions from you. Um, so at the bottom of the, of the screen, you'll see there's a little Q&A um, icon. If you click on that, you can pop um, questions through to us. I'll be reading through the questions and interrupt Jared during the, the demo um, to, to answer the questions that, um, that, that you may have. Um, the webinar is also being recorded, um, so our marketing team will be sending that um, through to you via email um, during the course of, of tomorrow. And if we're unable to answer any of the questions this evening, we'll also pop that through um, to you via, um, via email. Um, but yeah. From my side, that's, that's it. I'll, I'll hopefully assist Jared in answering some of the questions that you may have. Um, but Dr. Israel, maybe if you want to share with us your, your experience in running a fully digital practice. Okay, great. Firstly, I just want to check if my mic's working. Are you able to hear me? Yeah. 100%. Okay, great. Um, so I started off just to give you a bit of my background, I, I used to work in a group practice that wasn't digital. Um, that was one of the old fashioned file practices and it was a great practice, but we used to invest a lot in of time and effort and even money in employing people who would run backward and forward between our office, our offices and the front um, filing files and looking for files and losing files. So when I started my own my own practice in um, 2012 or so, I decided that it was a good opportunity for me to start digitally. So at that point, I didn't really know which platform to use and there weren't as many platforms as there are now in the market. And I decided that um, the first one that came to me, I decided I would go for. So I started on a platform where I was writing on an iPad and I used to I used to just take notes of for my few patients that I had then on the iPad, and I had the privilege of being able to just you know not have to deal with files. Um, I, I fortuitously just came to Jared at that point. I mean, we, our paths met, and he made me aware that Healthbridge developing Healthbridge being a switch in my life at that stage, and um, was was developing a doctor app where one could write notes on a web interface. So I took the opportunity at that point of, of, of giving that a shot. And what really what impressed me from the beginning 
was the fact that it was just such a simple app. Um, at that point, it, it was just an app that we, 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 we call it an app, but it was really just a web interface where, where, where you could just make notes, um, write, write a little bit of patient history, make a diagnosis, um, save it. And what I really loved about it from the beginning was that wherever I was, so at that point I had a little practice at home and I also used to work out of another place. I could just log onto my computer and see my patient know. And it told me, uh, and that really was the game changer for me, was that even then the app was linked to the switch, which meant, you see, prior to this, I used to write, I used to make my notes even digitally, and as some of us still do, to, some doctors still do today, keep a list at the end of the day of patients seen in the diagnoses, and then at the end of the day, the job was to sit down for either myself or the receptionist or whoever was helping me and and Bill put through the 0191 and the diagnosis code and whatever was done. And, and that, that was a whole job in itself. And really what impressed me about this system was that it was linked. So all I had to do is make my notes, put down the diagnosis and what I did. And when I closed the patient file, it had already been billed to the medical aid. So it almost made the billing automatic. And that was something that really was a game changer for me. Um, from then onwards, I really saw this as an opportunity that we could just develop this app. So not being part of HealthBridge, but being someone who really had a vested interest in how things developed, I worked with a bit with a HealthBridge team in terms of discussing things that we could do to enhance the app. And um, not me alone, because obviously being an individual, every doctor's biased to the things that they deal with and, and, and how they, they, they practice medicine and see their patients. But a couple of other doc, few other doctors got involved, and over the last couple of years, Healthbridge has developed a whole new version of this doctor app, the Healthbridge Clinical, which now has much more capability capabilities. This new app, which Jared will take you through, um, has the ability to to um, deal with chronic conditions. Um, has the ability to help you track your patient's vitals, help you track your the metrics of the patient's reminders, communications of the patients, a whole lot of features. The important thing though for me is that I think that when you're going digital, um, it's a leap for anyone who isn't digital at the, at the, at the time. And it's important to understand that I think the biggest barrier for a doctor in going digital is not being caught in the complexities of technology or the need to be able to fill in a whole lot of things just to get through a consult. And what HealthBridge has done really well is they've created this space where you can make it as simple as you want to a practice where we're seeing 10 patients a day and we really dealing with complex patients. One can interact with the app and really fill in a ton of stuff so that when you come back to your notes, you're able to see a whole lot of complexity and really get everything in there. On the other hand, if you're running a busy practice where you just want to get diagnoses through and have a little bit of notes that you can refer to, you're not tied into having to fill in a million check boxes and notes in order to do that. And, and then also just one more thing that I, what we've seen over the time is initially the HealthBridge platform was really suited for people who knew how to type. And, and, and I took to that because I enjoy typing. But a lot, of my, a lot of my colleagues felt that typing was a hindrance to them. So this hasn't really been so much up my side, but with other doctors, there's been a lot of development on the platform where even if you're not a typer and you just want to click and you want to just you know, tick box things, the app intelligently guides you through a reason for encounter from a patient so that you don't have to spend time um, you know, really interacting with your keyboard all the time instead of focusing on the patient. So it really, for me personally, this thing has game changed my practice. I wouldn't look back. Um, I'm, I'm not paid by HealthBridge to say that. Um, I have no vested interest in saying that at all. 
Um, but, but I really, it's changed my practice. I, I'm sitting at my house now and if a patient phones me and says, you know, Dr. Israel, last time you gave me something and I need a script for something and please can you help me? And I can open my phone, I can look back and I can do it on my phone right now and even email it and send it to them off my phone. So it's really changed my practice a lot and I'm really grateful for the team for, for that um, change and that opportunity. Thanks, Dr. Israel. Jared. Over to awesome. you. Cool. Um, I you, can't, have, you can't let Dr. Israel down now after he's so high. Yeah, sure. <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah thanks. Um, so I do get carried away and get excited and speak quite quickly. If I do, I'll just ask Yvonne or, or Dr. Israel just to rein me in. Um, and we'll also try to uh, bring, weave in some of the questions um, or anything I forget, Yvonne will, will chime in. Um, I think it's, it's you know, it's quite important to acknowledge that there is a growing appreciation for going digital and moving to an EMR. Um, something that seemed quite lofty a few years ago um, and ambitious and difficult is now becoming a reality. Um, and it's, I mean, it's great. We have uh, almost 40 people on the call tonight. Um, so there's definitely an appetite for it. So, so what I want to cover is, is what to look out for, uh, what's important, because it is a journey. It's not a, you know, a flicker switch and suddenly you're a digital practice. Um, and I'd be very wary of anyone trying to sell that, you know, a digital practice overnight in a box. Um, as Dr. Israel mentioned, there's, you know, there's different dynamics, uh, whether you're a typer or a clicker, um, depending on the admin staff you have, do you have a nurse in your practice and that type of thing. So we, we've tried to understand that. Uh, we've tried to make sure that it's a, an easy journey to go digital um, and that we know it's not a, a, a one size fits all. Um, we're not uh, clinicians by nature. We are uh, engineers and techies. Um, so it was great to work with the likes of Dr. Israel and a whole bunch of other doctors just to just to make sure that we we have like little nuggets of gold that'll make it easier for you guys to to adopt um, going digital and that's without further ado I'm going to share my screen um, I think it's just important to to do a, a bit of an orientation um, there I'm going to show you I'm going to spend 99 percent of the time on the on the clinical side of things um, we do have a, a PMA and an admin side uh, with all the bells and whistles that you would expect. Um, I'm just going to touch on it because the first thing to, to note and when looking for an EMR and going digital it, is it needs to be a seamless uh, process between admin side and the clinical side. There is a, a clear you know, differentiation of roles and responsibilities. So while we, we have the, this admin side that has things like a calendar and a waiting room, um, I'm going to switch between this and the digital side, which is very much focused on, on the practitioner. Um, so, so as a doctor, you would log into the clinical side, um, but you would have a view of your, of your waiting room, you know, from your admin person. So it's a seamless integration um, and you'd be able to see your diary of, you know, what your day looks like. All of that, while it's done by the admin person, needs to be visible to you as the doctor. Um, so in terms of the clinical space, there's, there's two main areas I'm going to touch on. One is this uh, waiting room and, and calendar, and then it's going to be the actual patient file itself. I'm going to try not get too bogged down in, in the weeds and the details, um, just show you kind of how it all ties together and then answer some questions. Okay, great. So, so if you look here in the waiting room, um, what an admin person or receptionist would typically do, uh, using the, the PMA side is schedule appointments, um, say what kind of appointments they are. Um, so for instance, here we have a waiting room with Florence, Brian and Lawrence all waiting. All of this is dummy test data. Um, and we can also see that Brian has been marked as a telehealth, um, so a virtual consult, which I'll, I'll show as well. Um, and this then reflects again on the doctor's side. So he can see uh, here's Brian who um, had an appointment 15 minutes ago, Lawrence two hours ago, um, just to help manage their diary and day. So very easy to then open the file. So I'll, I'll click on Lawrence Jones as an example and it takes you to that patient's record. Now what's important here, there's a lot of stuff on the screen that I'll, I'll take you through, but really the, the patient is divided into two sections. There's the patient file and then there's the consultation flow. So I'm going to hide that for the moment and just spend, spend a little bit of time on this, this patient overview, um, just showing you know, what it does and how it works. 
Um, what we're trying to mimic is that you don't need to have that yellow file in front of you that before you, you, you consult with the patient, you can have everything you need at your fingertips. So for Lawrence Jones, um, I can see that he enjoys hiking and camping outdoors. Uh, he loves to talk about diet. He's asthmatic, an insomniac, he's on Ventolin, he takes Stillnox, uh, we've discontinued Dormican, um, some surgical information, uh, some lifestyle information. So it's, it's just a one-stop shop of that key information that you wanna have about the patient before you interact with them. Um, and it, there's, as we scroll down the screen a little bit, there's a timeline. Um, what this is, is just a view of all those kind of clinical encounters you've had with the patient. And this builds up over time and as you use the system. So for instance, I can see with this patient, they, they were here for acute upper respiratory infection on the 7th. Uh, they also were here again for that on the 21st of Jan. If I want more information, I can expand this and I can see, oh yes, okay, he was complaining about a cough for a week. It was worse at night. I did an examination, checked his blood pressure. I prescribed, I did a referral letter, there was a medical certificate, um, and I asked him to come back for a follow-up visit as part of the plan. So I'll, I'll show you how this information is populated, but really the essence is, what do I need to know as I open a patient file? What will help me um, with that interaction with the patient? Um, Jared, yeah. maybe it's something you were gonna cover, but um, because we you started off speaking about that you know, practice doesn't transition from being digital overnight. Just if you can maybe share with us that um, that icon of the, the patient file, that little graphic that was uh, adjacent. There we go. Yes, great. Okay, so there's, there's different ways to go digital. Um, some practices have tried to, you know, take the whole filing cabinet and, and scan it in. Uh, varied results. As you can imagine, admin people do not love doing that. Um, what we've seen work quite nicely uh, when, you, when you're going digital is as a patient arrives, the admin person will then scan the, the previous paper record and it'll appear, appear here for the doctor. So the admin person will have their own interface. They can scan the record. As the doctor, you can then have that uh, access to the patient's uh, historic file. I can click on it. It's a little bit small, but you get the drift. Um, it's just there at your fingertips should you need it. Obviously, it's not relevant for, for all patients. Um, so some of the kind of uh, the guidance and help we have is um, another way of doing it. Doctor, you've got your yellow file. Uh, you can put a sticker on it after you've seen the patient, which says scan or don't scan, hand it to the admin, and then they'll scan it at the end of the consultation and archive that paper file. So, you know, there might be instances where you're like, well, there's nothing really in this yellow file. Don't bother scanning it. Uh, or you have a patient with, you know, heaps of notes and it might be relevant. You can scan it and have it here at your fingertips. Um, the other thing, you know, it's, it's great to have uh, all this information here, but you don't want to make it so difficult for a doctor to, to move and transition from the yellow file to this. So like, oh, you know, this, this is very easy. You can, you can just type in here, um, loves talking about banting or whatever it might be, um, or loves talking for instance, if this, if, but what we've tried to do is make it really simple and easy. So for surgical information, you can click on here and it's a simple tick box. So you can say grommets, uh, you can add a note to it, say 2016, um, or you, you can add a little note at the bottom and then it adds it back to that overview. And here we go, you can see the grommets. You don't wanna create something, you know, that takes a long time to go digital that you have to type all these notes out or recapture them. So some of this information such as the conditions and the, and the medication, you can actually do during the consultation, so you can, which I'll, which I'll show you. But it's just, it's more about the philosophy. Make it as quick and easy for people, uh, or for, for practices and practitioners to add this information. Otherwise, you know, going digital becomes a, a big hurdle. So whether it's surgical notes or, or lifestyle information, you can, you know, it's very easy, click, click, click. You can work out pack years if it's important. Um, you can change their stress level and you can go back to the file and it updates everything. Um, so Jared, uh, mm. we, we've got four questions and um, three of them are, um, are maybe more related to when you take us through actually capturing the consultation, but the one that just popped in was around, um, do you have to keep the paper um, file once, once you've scanned it? 
It's yeah, a very, very good question. You can archive it. Um, you don't really need the paper file once it's scanned. So the idea is to kind of free up space in your practice. Uh, that, you know, have, have the files that you haven't scanned there. So when the patients do come in, you can scan them. And once that's done, we recommend archiving them. Cool, thanks. Cool. Um, just a, a little bit of information around this overview before I jump into the consultation. You'll see that there's some almost appears to be duplicate information down the side here, such as conditions, medication, allergies. But this information will remain here during the consultation process, which I'll jump into. So at any stage, while you're doing symptoms or examination or your diagnosis, you have key information available that, you know, he's registered as an asthmatic, for instance. Um, there's also a little icon here that's indicating that the patient is liable for 2,081 Rand. Um, again, it's all the little things, docs, as I've said, when a patient comes in, I want to know X, Y, Z. Um, even, even the way we display it. So we've got the exclamation mark here. Some practices, some doctors don't want to know what the patient does. They're like, I don't want it to, you know, influence anything. I don't want to speak to them about billing. So we haven't put an amount there. The doctors who do want to know can hover over or click on it and understand more about their accounts and information. So it's just little things like that, that, that we've picked up working with, with practices. Okay, I'm gonna, if there are any and maybe, other maybe Jerry, just on that, um, that particular, that panel on the right hand side um, mm -hmm. remains in view throughout the consultation. Yes. And I mean, when I, when I sat in, in those um, design sessions with the doctors, the way they described that, it's that front cover that you typically have on the, either the cover, you know, cover of, the, of your patient file or that loose one summary piece of paper that you can always refer to. Yes, exactly. Certain things need to be in your face, like a aspirin allergy, for example. So that is always there down the side. Um, and we, we've tried to simulate the real world. So you might have this patient file open, um, but another patient phones in, um, another Jones will do Brian Jones, and you can open that patient file, speak to Brian Jones, check if, you know, if he's asking questions about a medicine, you can quickly check his file close it and carry on with, with whatever you were doing previously. So there's not this, you know, restriction of, that you have to fit into a funnel or, or a way of working, which is pretty important. Um, well, and that's, also, yeah. Interject, it also allows you to just be less reliant on your screen. So you start learning to put things onto that summary that you find important in the consults. And then you, you have a quick glance in the corner of your eye, you can see the summary of the patient. So you spend more of your time looking at the patient and less of your time going through previous scrolling down the screen in the history. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, it's uh, oh, uh, on that note, so, so talking points, I mean, I just have um, silly examples here, but they are helpful, but we've seen some acronyms that, that doctors use uh, that uh, just to, you know, uh, topics to avoid or little things to maybe speak to the patient about, um, like DA for drug addiction and, and things like that. So, so you, there is a bit of flexibility to what you can use this for. Okay. Um, there's also health ID integration. So if it's a discovery patient, you can open it up, uh, deep link into health ID and, and view anything in health ID for that patient. Okay, so, so that's, yeah. Maybe Jared, before, before you start, because I can see a number of questions are coming through. Um, so the one is, can you change items um, in terms of personal preferences? Uh, not currently. So the, the overview is, is static. So what we've tried to do is make sure it cases for the 90%. Um, so what are the must have things like conditions, medication, surgical information? Um, Alerts, sorry, I didn't touch on alerts. Alerts come from the medical aid. So it's a key care patient. Uh, it'll tell you that who the primary doctor is or how many visits they have uh, to go. But no, this, this information right now is, is, is static in terms of what you can customize here. Oh, and then maybe the other question and then the, the other ones are, I'll wait until you take us through the actual consultation was, if there are two doctors in the same practice with separate um, practice numbers, um, because one is a family physician, the other one is a GP, but they want to share the same patient information, is something like this possible? 
so within the billing practice, so if they fall under the, the same billing practice, yes, then, then you would have uh, access to the files. So Dr. Israel's practice has um, multiple GPs working there um, and a nurse. So you can um, open and access the, the files, the patient files for that practice. We don't have patient file sharing across practices currently. I'll touch on, on the referral side. Um, it, yeah. So as long as it's a same billing practice number, different treating doctors, then um, the files can be shared. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Cool. I'll keep um, the other questions for for later. Okay. Cool. Um, great. So I'm gonna I'm gonna jump into the consultation, and I think uh, it's important to note here that uh, so Dr. Israel touched on it. You, you get practices who, who are happy to type and practices who are, are, are more comfortable clicking. And it really is a 50-50 split. So I'm gonna first go through the, the clicking type and then show how it can be uh, <clears throat> further reduced to, to make it even quicker for those who can type uh, versus click. So I think people who've used uh, EMRs or EHRs are, are pretty comfortable or, or pretty familiar, I should say, with uh, body systems um, and the approach that a lot of EMRs have taken. So, you know, your personal complaint of a cough and you'll click on lungs on a body chart and then it'll kind of expand this long list of potential and often irrelevant information. Um, so we've gone with a reason for visit approach. So once you select a reason for visit, you'll go through the consultation flow, which is you'll capture the symptoms, you'll do the examination, uh, you'll, you'll diagnose, add an ICD-10 code, um, add medicines to it, complete the plan, and, and if you want to review or, and see the invoice and the billing, what Dr. Israel touched on, that it kind of aggregates um, everything and sends it off either to your admin or directly to the medical aid. Um, but these reason for visits and visit types and, and complaints, they are specific, they change the template. So I'll, I'll use COVID because it's, it's topical and, and we've recently added it by request of doctors. Because I select COVID, the symptoms and examination questions for me are gonna be COVID related. Um, and it's a quick, for, for the clickers, it's just super quick that, you know, they can speak to the doctor, um, speak to the patient without, without having to kind of be fixated on the screen. You can have that conversation. What have you been experiencing? Fever, coughs, sore throats, uh, loss of taste, body pains. Um, and as the practitioner, it's a simple click, yes, no, yes, irrelevant, I'm gonna skip it, skip it, skip it, loss of taste, yes, um, chest pain, you can, and maybe you wanna add an additional note to it. And as you do this, and I'll click here for the consultation summary, it's building up that clinical consultation. Um, if you hear my kids going crazy in the background, I apologize, it's bedtime, so they, they, <laughs> they're fighting it. Um, but it's, it's just really easy for someone who can't type and the template changes. So if I choose hypertension follow-up visit, you're not going to get uh, fever and uh, loss of taste, for example. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we work with practitioners. So we, we refine these and the idea is to get kind of the 80, 90% of, to make sure that the questions are relevant and there is space to type um, should you, should you want to type notes. Um, you know, patient complains of, and then sore throat, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you don't, which I'll get to a bit later, you don't have to have the, the reason for visits and go through templates. If you're comfortable with typing, we can hide all of that. Or if you want to start off without templates and just typing and we'll introduce templates later, as I touched on, it's, it's, it, it can be this digital journey that you can go through. I'll, I'll, I'll carry on with this setup for now and then we can, we can tweak things as we go. Um, Jared, maybe before you continue, um, the mm -hmm. questions um, relating to how you can actually capture um, the information. So we, we had a question um, right up front saying, can you use speech to text on, on this application? And I know that's something that the team is working on. Yeah, yeah, uh, great question. I think, so, so we've got to the point where, you know, it's, it's the 80% is, is, you know, we try to make sure this, we've put in the most important things first and got it right, and then we can start kind of adding the bells and whistles, such as uh, speech to text, stylus support, that type of thing. So if you, if you look here, there's actually a speech to text option here. On, this is currently in test. 
I wasn't even gonna bring this up, but since it was deliberately asked, this is what we're testing now. We haven't rolled it out because we've got to make sure, we don't wanna just put features there for the sake of features. We wanna make sure, you know, the best products do the essential really well. And if we're gonna add something, it has to really work. It has to have a medical dictionary. It has to support accents. Um, so we're busy trialing different, different solutions for that currently. Um, so the, the test doctors will, will have this. Right, the other, the other question was related to being able to use the stylus. Oh, okay, yeah, the same thing. So, so we further down the line with uh, speech to text. Um, the stylus uh, is still very much in, in development. Cool. But Thanks. a speech to text was originally on the, uh, I mean, for, for devices that use yep. speech to text in text boxes, like Apple iPhones and iPads, one is able to use speech to text just as one would in a WhatsApp or any, any exactly. other. Exactly. Yeah, no, it's a good point. I think speech to text is there if, if you want to use the native iOS or Android, but what we're trying to do is, you know, if you want to say Numavax, that it, it can pick up those type of words. So we're not quite uh, there yet with with the whole medical dictionary. So you can use the native sports uh, if you're using an iOS device, but um, we're still very much tinkering with the, the voice to text. Oh, um, sure, no, no problem. Um, I'm gonna continue. So, so we're in symptoms here. As I mentioned, it changes by the template. Same, same philosophy for examination. Um, there is some static information that's always there. You can capture your temperatures, your blood pressure, um, you can expand this and it has the whole range from glucose test, to cholesterol, ECG, etc. cetera. Um, if you have a nurse, um, a nurse can complete this under the, the vital section here before you see the, the patient. Um, and then you can view it on the timeline. Um, we have Jackal that's collapsed by default. So you can show the options here. If relevant, we don't force anything. Um, you can then again, click yes, 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 no, no, no. Um, if you take the clicking approach. Um, examination, so again, COVID, there's, there's certain questions, uh, we'll use um, equal air entry as an example. Uh, if I say no to this, it'll ask additional questions. Um, is decreased, okay, so is it localized? Um, where's localized, that type of thing. And as I click, here's the record that gets generated. It's a very, very simple, um, yeah, easy to use. Um, bef I, I'm going to go a little bit, but before I go further on, sorry, I've, I just wanted to mention that, you know, telehealth, and I, and I want to cover this slightly earlier. Um, so I can see that I have Brian Smithers in an hour and that's gone red because Brian's actually on the telehealth call. He's really waiting for the doctor. So I can see it in, in my diary. Um, because it is a telehealth call, there's a little, um, there's a, a telehealth button here. And when I launch that, I will then connect to Brian. Now, the, the power of this is um, from a patient perspective, they don't have to um, install apps. They don't have to register. Um, they agree to consent when they join it. It's just an SMS that gets sent to them before the visit saying, you know, your, your appointment is at 10 o'clock. Um, then they'll get a reminder closer to the appointment. They'll click on the link. They'll join that consultation. Um, agree to consent and you, you as the doctor can, can interact directly in the system with them. Um, so I've actually got a, a another a bridge in that's here. Hello, Jaten. Sorry, I, I kept you waiting. How are you doing? Uh, you, yeah. Good. So, so you, <laughs> he's sick. Yeah. So, so you guys, you, you're not able to hear him right now, but as a, as a doctor, I can carry on with the consultation flow that I was showing you and ask you 10 questions. So I'll say, you know, Jaten, what brings you in? And, and he'll say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really suffering from, from heartburn and I can click heartburn and just carry on with the process and ask him kind of, you know, what, understand a bit more about his main complaint, ask him, you know, is it, what kind of pain is it? Does it feel like it's stabbing, or burning, is it crushing? I tick what I need to tick. If, if I need to get a bigger view of Jaten, I can expand it. Um, <laughs> I can, I can minimize it, but we've, we've really worked hard to make sure it doesn't, it doesn't get in the way of, of completing clinical notes. Um, so 
uh, you know, Dr. Israel would be a, a case of, you know, Jaten, okay, complaints of sore throat, uh, burning pain, or whatever it might be, um, and carry on the consult with, with this telehealth window open. I just, I want, I know Jaten was waiting on, on the call, so I just wanted to bring it in while I'll continue um, kind of the, the flow of the consultation we were doing, just to give you a, a feel for how telehealth integrates. Yes, sorry, Yvonne. And, and maybe if I can just, uh, if I can just add, um, certainly the, the one thing that we found, and we've, we've recently been reaching out to a number of doctors that have started using um, our telehealth um, uh, product, and the one thing is just the, like Jared mentioned, the ability that patients have, the ease with which they can connect. So that link comes through in the SMS uh, appointment reminders. So typically your staff via the um, PMA platform that um, Jared um, showed you right, right up front would book that appointment. They're going to get an SMS reminder, an email reminder, and simply by them clicking a link, they come through the exact same screen um, that you as the doctor would, and then you're both joining this virtual consultation um, secure uh, environment. Exactly. Uh, Yvonne, I mean, it's, um, we don't want the doctor to have to manage, what, what is my next patient? Is it a, a video call? Is it a voice call? What time were they here? Are they on the call? We don't, you know, you don't, you don't want a GP to connect to a call and, oh, the patient's not there. So these, these little things uh, that we've built in to see that it's read, that the patient's waiting, that his appointment's actually in an hour, um, that I have Florence waiting and her appointment was 39 minutes ago. And that, that is managed, that is the, 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 something that needs to be considered when, when choosing an EMR. You have great standalone solutions. Uh, there's, there's, you know, um, products from the US that are great, but you, it's really important to have seamless workflow with, with your admin person and your front staff. Um, otherwise, you, you're gonna have to manage that on, on your own. Yeah. Okay, so so I'm gonna continue with, with the flow here. Where we got to was, um, the, the examination, it's now at the point of diagnosis. I'm actually gonna say goodbye to Jaten, shame. You don't have to hang on the call for the next next 10 minutes. Thanks for connecting, cheers. Uh, uh, maybe Jared, just a quick other question related to telehealth. Is this integrated with discovery and med scheme um, schemes? Yes, uh, can we build schemes and normal consults if they don't have a, a, a teleconsult code? Absolutely. So we we work with the um, with the schemes and where um, teleconsult codes have been provided, like with MedScheme and, and Discovery, we we make those available. Um, otherwise, you, you know, you you use your your normal codes. So yeah, yeah. Great. Okay. So so after the um, examination, you do a diagnosis code. Uh, some feedback we got. If you have existing conditions, make them available straight away that you don't have to search for it. Otherwise, you can search for it. Help me with my spelling. I'm not great at spelling. Um, so I spelled bronchitis wrong as a silly example. Um, and I can just select the appropriate RC10 code. Um, at the same point, so what I spoke to earlier is you don't have to, you know, build up the, the clinical record in one place and then, you know, have to do something else in another place. If you're going to uh, diagnose them with something uh, chronic or you want to, you know, to be on the patient overview, I can simply just pin it and then it'll be pinned on that patient record. So for here, I've, I've pinned the, his asthma, his insomnia, his hypertension and his type 2 diabetes. Um, and it's, it's really and, just a click. And Jared, you were just clicking through, so again, the, the on my, my right hand yes, side. thank you. And how it's uh, how it's swapped between those three different views. Yeah, oh, great, thank you, Yvonne. The um, again, not to be constricted to one area. So, so within this patient file for Lawrence, I can see his record. I can look at the summary of the consultation down the side, and I can capture some notes. If if I really want to type up something long, and I don't necessarily want to put it inside symptoms or examination, I can type it here and it adds it to the patient record. You can take a photo and importantly I can attach a file um, as well. So that's that's within this context of Lawrence Jones but also you know if uh, I might want to quickly check who's in my waiting room um, or I want to quickly check if I have any new pathology results 
um, or go to my path center. So that's what that, that side panel is there. Um, because I, I selected bronchitis as an example, the medicines that come up are, are specific to bronchitis. I want to I spend a little bit more time on this section because it's quite important how this works. As you use the, the system, it learns your, your preferences around medicines. So this is where kind of the, the AI and machine learning comes in. Um, as you start using it, there's a, a concept of community. So, you know, it won't just be blank. Um, if if I, you know, I selected acute bronchitis here, I can see that it's brought up my antibacterials, penicillin based, um, scroll down, I've got obstructive airway disease drugs. So it's, it's, it's bringing it up that's relevant to bronchitis. If I deselect bronchitis and select asthma, the suggestions will change again and they'll be based on your practice and what you prescribe and dispense. It learns as you go, but at the same time, you can, if you start using a new drug, you don't want to wait for the system to learn from you. You can, you can favorite it and it'll start appearing here immediately. Um, little nuances that are, are super important. I can see that, oh, this patient is registered for Ventolin. Um, so that helps with the decision making at this point. Uh, other important things, let me look for generics and you can filter the list to generics. I can see that as, um, Astavent is part of the formulary for this patient. Uh, so that it just little bits of information just to help help make the, the choice, the, the right choice. Um, we, and again, this is based on what you use and what you learn. If you keep using Atrovent, that'll go to the top. If you tell the system, I use, I put it at the top, it'll then be at the top. Um, there's the family of medicine concept. So maybe, um, it's not quite that dosage I want or milligrams and I can go in here and change it. I will go to, sh I'll show some of the other cool features. So there's the uh, information about it. So for, uh, you know, the SAMF information that you typically find. So for Zithromax, I'll click I, it'll tell me the indications, pediatric doses, preparations, contraindications, that type of thing. Um, and this we're building up uh, with, with SAMF. Uh, partnering with them. The if if I add a medicine, so I will I'll choose Augmentin as an example. I'll add it. We don't want to create a complex structure of of, of dosages. Um, again, we learn dosages. That's the AR. We know for Augmentin, typically you'd have one tablet twice a day for five days, and if there's something additional, you know, take off the meals, you can put it there and add it to your prescription. Um, whereas if, if I choose Zithromax um, suspension, the dosages are different. You're not getting the one pull twice a day, you get the five mils three times a day. Um, and we, we don't force anything. If, if you know, you can, you can leave it blank, you can type it in, you can choose duration. We're not trying to, you know, force people into a rigid, rigid way of working. If you dispensing, you click on dispensing, shows you the pack size, shows you the quantity, and you can choose dispensing. So we've, we've spent an inordinate amount of time working on, on the medicine side just to make sure that we get this right. It's got to be quick, it's relevant to the RC10 code. It pops up meds that you use. You don't have to start um, creating templates. It understands your habits, brings those meds forward. It can be very quick and easy to, you know, what you do is click add and hit add to prescription and it's done. Also spelling. Uh, as an example, we've, we've tried to cater for that too, for, which helps when I'm doing demos. Mm -hmm. um, scroll down a little bit. Uh, we've got the summary of what you've selected. If you select more than one medicine, so I'll choose Classid as an example. Let me add that to the prescription. Maybe I want, okay, this is a very silly example. Let's not do two antibiotics. Uh, let's do Ventolin, uh, one inhaler for seven days but I want this to be in a separate script. I can split it. So the, these are the things that the practices have guided us. We, you know, it's like, oh, well, you, you want a script for your um, chronic versus your acute potentially, um, or I want to dispense one, prescribe the other, and all that information's here. Um, I can then pin the medicine again. So if it's something that I want to see on the timeline in the future, oh, sorry, not on the timeline, the patient overview, 
So in this view or the landing page for the yellow file, all I do is click pin, say what it's against, and I'll just say in this example, because Zithromax, I'll just say it's other medication. It's not linked to one of these chronic conditions. And all the bells and whistles you'd expect, you can email this, you can print it. Um, it's got letterheads, digital signatures, uh, really what, what you'd need from, from the solution. You can email all the, the files you generate. So when we do a sick note, um, a script, referral letter, all of that can be emailed in one go or printed in one go later on, or you can just simply hit print here. Um, we've often, you know, a, a practice will connect it to the printer in the front, the patient will collect it on the way out. Uh, you, some practices have, have uh, you know, oh, please go to the admin, settle your bill and collect your script. Um, for obvious reasons. Um, uh, Jared, a question just popped um, through, which was, how does the patient detail enter, not the clinical, which you've been um, showing us, things like the address, the telephone number, the medical aid get in? Um, I mean, I'm happy to answer this. As, as Jared um, showed, the, the, this product works seamlessly with our PMA, which we call My MPS. So those patient demographic information um, lives inside our, our, our PMA, my MPS, also cloud-based. And because the systems work together, um, that information is shared, um, is shared between the two. However, on the, the clinical side, obviously the, the admin staff have absolutely no access to any of the, the clinical information that um, the doctor enters or is available inside um, HealthBridge Clinical. Um, it, it is, there is a clear distinction between the two different users. Yeah. Again, it's that integration between admin and, and practitioner. Cool, I'm gonna shoot on to, to plan quickly. Um, with, as with every section, there's a, a notes, should you wanna populate anything specific? Um, and then what you typically see in plan. So if you wanna do a sick note, choose whether you want the RC10 code on it, um, an SMS to patient. This is very popular, so we'll say patient, I'll, I think I'd like to see you again in two weeks time um, and the patient will get an SMS in two weeks time that says, Lawrence, you're due to see Dr. Harold Bridge, contact 111 to book an appointment. Um, and you can amend this, please come fostered. Or whatever note you wanna to add to it, or you can change the text altogether if, if you like. Referral letter, we, you can create a new template. Um, when you click on this, it generates all, all the kind of patient information that we have, the clinical relevant information. So we have your allergies, your conditions, any of the notes. If there are things that aren't applicable or you don't want the referring doctor to see, you can simply take it out. Uh, you can amend what's here. It's got clini any clinical metrics captured. It's got your previous visits there. Uh, and you can say, uh, please call me as soon as you see the patient, whatever it might be. And you can then email this directly to the referring doctor, or you can print it and give it to the, the patient to take with. Then we get to the invoice lines. There, there's some, again, AI driven. If I choose um, something to do with, um, let's say fatigue related RC10 code, it might ask me, it'll suggest to do a vitamin B injection. Along with that, it'll suggest gloves, it'll suggest uh, a swab. If I choose, a, if it was a telemed call, it would choose, it would suggest 0130 instead of 0190. Um, this patient has certain chronic conditions, it chose an asthma, so it's selecting, you know, it's suggesting that most likely I did a, a flow test, potentially a nebulization in the room. These things learn from your habits. It's, as you use the system, it becomes more and more relevant. As with, same with consumables, which will be underneath here. And certainly, Jared, I mean, again, in the feedback that I've heard is that typically these small things are what doctors may, may themselves forget um, to bill for or even let their staff know, whereas in now, mm -hmm. it's, it's easy to, it's, it's easy not to forget, I guess, and it's easy to, to decide whether or not you, you want to be able to, um, to bill for those often small little things, but at the end of the month, they, they add up. Absolutely. We, the amount of times completion of chronic medication forms is not done. Um, and it, it's suggesting this because we chose a, a, a chronic condition. 
So yeah, great point. When we, when we get to the bottom here, you can see uh, all the pricing of what we've selected. Uh, you can make any amendments if you like. You can choose to send it to your admin person. Uh, you can change it to cash or no charge. You can default certain things. It'll pull the prices from the PMA. So if you have private rates or, or specific scheme arrangements, all those prices are, are, are handled. Um, some what we often see again the digital journey is is practices or practitioners like to send it initially to the admin person this will then go into the inbox inside the pma the admin person can make sure that everything is sound send it off to to the scheme um, alternatively as soon as you hit finish it goes straight to the medical aid if it's a real-time uh, scheme such as discovery by the time the patient walks to the front desk to get his script he'll you'll have uh, you'll know what's outstanding or not what we often see from admin is collect outstanding amount uh, the doctor will send a message to the admin person please collect an outstanding amount from the from the patient before he leaves now i've taken a bit of time kind of clicking through it and and templates but there's this can be as as, as broad or, or vast as you want or you can really trim it down that you can you can start off you can go straight to diagnosis put in IC10 code capture some clinical notes here select your medicines and say finish and it's done it really depends on on, on what you're looking for inside the EMR and, and how how comprehensive you want to do do you want to type do you want to click um, do you want to have notes for symptoms versus examination or do you just want to have general consultation notes you won't even write on a piece of paper and at the end of the consultation ask the admin person to scan it in and it appears on the record it's there's, there's it's not one size fits all for for our practices and this this was the nice thing about working with different practices is these are the insights uh, that we've tried to help cater for okay i think we've left enough time for for more questions, yeah, for questions. sorry i just uh, i see dr israel um lost connection but he's trying to um okay back um yeah. back on and i've also just asked liza i think we maybe have a bit of a capacity in terms of the number of um people people that we have on but liza's trying to assist dr israel and um, maybe in the interim we did get a, a few questions come through um so this evening we've got both um hopefully new clients to the Healthbridge family as well as existing existing clients. So one of the questions that we've been posed is from an existing client, which is how can I convert um, from Dr. App, uh, which Dr. Israel mentioned up front was the predecessor to Healthbridge Clinical and um, to Healthbridge Clinical. Yeah, so the, the great thing is you don't have to do anything. Um, the there's no data conversions or transfers or whatnot. It's it's a seamless process where um, we'll get in touch with you, or you can reach out and and we'll just help in the, turn it on, enable it for you, and and train you. So it's it's quick and easy to use. Um, and maybe we can reach out to the um, to the doctor. I've got your name. Um, we'll get Great. Um, and I'm sure we've got your, got practice number. We'll reach out to you because the team has now just initiated starting to uh, move our clients that are using Dr. App across to, to Healthbridge Clinical. So I've, I've made a note and we'll, we'll get um, in touch with you tomorrow. Um, another question, what does it look like if there is a main member and a dependent? Cool. Um, on the overview, we have a, a account member structure. So if there's multiple account members, you'll be able to see um, the, the different account members and the account code. So Florence Jones is, is the main member, um, Lawrence is the husband. Um, and if there's other account members who aren't necessarily family, but on the same account, they'll also show there. And like, like Jared mentioned, because it, it works um, seamlessly with um, our MyMPS um, PMA system. Yeah, the, the sorry, Ivana, also the, the account, because it works with it, the account information is there. So it's, you know, if I click on discovery here, I can go see the patient liable amount. If there's a benefit check that happens automatically in the background, it tells how much benefits are left and all the medical aid details, um, should I want to see that. Yeah, and maybe just on that, um, it's a great point and you've reminded me, Jared, um, 
we know that we're only showing you our Healthbridge Clinical um, EMR um, this evening and a number of doctors would then say, but I also want to see my NPS. Again, our sales team would be um, happy, our business consultants, to, um, to take you um, through that. And they'll be in touch during the course of tomorrow should you want um, to see what my NPS um, looks like if you're not an existing client um, of Healthbridge. So what triggered me to say that was Jared mentioned something like the, the benefit check. Uh, which we trigger off when an appointment um, gets created on on the my MPS system. That um, that's maybe we'll leave that to to the my MPS um, demo. Then other question, Jared, uh, where I have different locums working in the practice, do they have their own profiles? And um, from the same doctor, second question, can I review the visits in real time before the patient leaves? Um, in other words, is a, a junior locum? Uh, transfers to a senior doctor for review? Okay, so we, we definitely cater for locums. Um, we don't put a restriction also on, on practice numbers uh, being the same, depending on how you set up your locum. So you can have multiple users within the same practice. Um, interesting question around uh, reviewing. Um, there is a, it depends on the setup. There's, it's not such a straightforward answer. There is an option to save save this. So you can save it for later. Can see save was successful and someone can then go open and view it and see what's there um there might just be a few nuances i need to think through like how would you be notified or, or whatnot but you can save something open it up again and then complete it so yeah should, should, yvonne if, if you want i can give some rapid fire question and answers if you want like like the short question i mean short answers so I'm, I'm conscious of time. Okay, okay. We we there's not many not many to go. Um, what billing program is used? If we use MediDI, can it integrate or or convert it into the program? Nope, not currently integrated with MediDI. Um, potentially there might be a standalone version on depending on the need further down the year. But right now it's integrated with my MPS. And, and if I can add, um, should you should you wish to move from ADDI to our my MPS um, system, we do we do do a um, a patient demographic data um, extract as part of our data um, data migration. Again, maybe something um, that we can cover in more detail when we do the the my MPS um, demo. Um, a few more questions. Um, is is the app available to use? Absolutely. So um, is it? Does that mean play play on it or, or use it? So so it is available. <laughs> yes, it's live. Yeah. It's in the market. It's we we launched it in the beginning of the year in in January of this year, um, and we worked with with the team of doctors um, like Dr. Israel um, for the better part of of last year. But it's it's been in the market. Um, since since January of this year. I think that's what the question was. Okay. Um, next one, how do you convert from a competitor platform um, a PMA and, and switch? Like I mentioned, um, we do we do facilitate um, the the transition from an existing um, PMA onto our PMA and to then be able to use both our PMA and um, uh, Healthbridge, um, Healthbridge Clinical. Um, so our, our our sales team and then our um, client support team would would facilitate um, facilitate that move. What chances of trying to see if it works for you practically? Good question. I know yeah. Jared is working on something at the moment. Yeah. So so we're working on a um, demo mode that doctors can sign up, and it's just got dummy data. Uh, that you can play around in, it doesn't actually get sent to a medical aid or scheme, you don't need the PMA integration or anything like that. So that'll be available towards the end of May. Great. Um, I'm just going quickly because I'm conscious we've reached the top of the hour. Um, what is the cost uh, for a um, four-man practice? Uh, we 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 losing you a bit there, Jared. I think you've gone on mute. Sorry, I hit my mute button. Um, okay. Uh, you, I, I broke up there, but you want to answer, Yvonne? 
uh, okay, sure. So for um, the initial doctor, it would be at uh, a fee, of, a monthly fee of um, seven hundred and um, is it thirty six rand? Yeah, thirty rand, and then we charge an a, an additional fee for um, every treating doctor that you would add, which is um, two hundred and, and, and thirty rand. Again, it's a it's a monthly it's a monthly fee. So there's yeah. an initial fee for the um, initial um, billing um, doctor, and then an additional uh, fee for every treating doctor that um, that you would add on. Um, next question: How can one communicate bulk comms uh, via via SMS? So that feature of uh, um, bulk communication lives inside uh, my NPS. So, for example, like with the telehealth. We've assisted doctors in, in designing templates, how they can um, you know, broadcast to their patients to inform them how best you're dealing with um, uh, the COVID situation, how patients must come to your practice, and that functionality lives in my MPS. Uh, Jared did um, show the, um, the ability to then also send reminders uh, directly also on a one-on-one -on -on -one -on -one basis from the um, HealthBridge clinical, um, clinical app. I think we've covered the, the how much does the app cost. Can you use the system for cash patients in terms of teleconsult, um, uh, the payment uh, payment gate? Yes, uh, you can use our, our system for, for cash cash patients uh, for telehealth or, or for normal consults. Um, what is the cost? Um, for converting from my MPS to Healthbridge Clinical. So there's, there's no cost if you're an existing Healthbridge um, uh, uh, client that's using my MPS. As I mentioned previously, there's just the additional cost to um, take on the um, Healthbridge Clinical um, product. Again, the cost for the, treat, the main treating provider and then for any additional um, treating doctor that, that you add on. So seven thirty for the main and two thirty for the subsequent ones, subsequent Correct. doctors. And then I just quickly want to also just go back. I'm gonna, I think I may have missed uh, a question. There was a question around uh, platforms and iOS. Yes. Uh, Doctor Israel uses a Mac still, I believe, um, and an iOS phone. We are uh, we do support tablet um, as well. The mobile version. Is, is currently um, in testing. Um, it has slightly less number of, of features. Uh, you know, you're not going to have the full kind of clinical um, note-taking capability or whatnot, but as Dr. Israel pointed out, you can look up the patient, you can view their path results, you can email a script off. So, so we do support different, different devices and platforms. Great, and then I just quickly scanned through the questions. I think there were just two that I, I hadn't covered. Um, the one was uh, uh, what I would find helpful is an online consent capability where a patient can check uh, boxes on a tablet for consent or agree that they've informed. Um, so the reason I, I'd left this one for, for last is it's actually a meeting. I think it's our nine o'clock meeting tomorrow. Um, Jared, so it's not something that we have at the moment, but it's something that we um, are looking as, as yeah. part of um, the roadmap to uh, one, assist doctors in creating those consent forms that they need from the patients and then also to, um, to digitize that. So nothing, something we don't have at the moment, but something that um, the, the team is, is, um, is looking um, to, to develop and launching. And I think the last, the last I just thing need to was, get something out. Just for one yes, second, yes, go for it, go for it. That's really, for me, like the, the beauty with HealthBridge is that that's the point, is that the, the things that aren't there now are the things that become there in the future. So it almost becomes like a teamwork of the doctors with HealthBridge. Yeah, there's a team of us who are very involved with like advising on the, on the development. But, you know, like the, the HealthBridge team is very open to ideas. So, so when doctors email HealthBridge and say, we really would like, an extra form that, that so over this COVID time, we need a form that tells people that they're fit to go back to work because they don't have COVID symptoms or whatever is going on. Healthbridge will implement that. And that really, for me, is what has like, made the software. It's very dynamic and versatile. Thanks. Great, thanks. Yeah. We, we, we release every two weeks new features and yeah. functions. Every Tuesday night, every second Tuesday night. 
can't build everything. <laughs> Disclaimer. <laughs> but but, but yeah, we'll, the... we'll get there. And maybe, <laughs> maybe the last question from from Ma uh, that I think has been um, asked that we missed out on um, is a, a doctor with a practice that's ten years old that has two two thousand um, files. How easy is it to go digital? I think Jared covered this um, up front. We've had um, doctors with way more files um, um, go go digital. So I. I certainly know of a very successful um, example where uh, what the doctor implemented is every time the patient, you know, patient arrived, they would digitize religiously um, yeah. the file. And I think it was it was the entire file, the first couple of important pages, and and that's how that that practice chose to to go digital. So again, it, it depends on how the practice chooses to go um, digital one by one as you see the the patient or if you want to do it in a little bit more bulk format but um yeah we we've certainly it's not just one client but we've had a, a lot of success yeah. cases um the the a great one that i saw was uh, just a red and green sticker so the doctor would see the patient put a green sticker on the file and hand it to the admin person which means please scan this one red sticker means i don't need this scanned Cool. And um, okay, one last question popped in. Is the program, again, I know something uh, the team is working on, is the program available offline in case there's no internet? Yeah, um, what we recommend now, and it's one of the reasons we brought out the tablet version, is to have um, tablet as a backup with, uh, with the connectivity method, so 3G. Um, it's also one of the reasons we've done mobile, so at least if you have absolutely nothing and the electricity goes down or your computer's gone, uh, you can still view the patient record on your phone um, and have that patient clinical information there. There's the offline mode, uh, it, like a pure offline mode. This is web-based, is cloud-based, uh, so it requires an internet connection. Um, we are looking if there's, there's clever ways to still have a, a backup offline mode within a browser. But right now what we recommend is a, a backup tablet. Great. So maybe last words from our side is like I, I think I've already mentioned it. Um, our marketing team will be sharing the webinar, the recording with you. Should you just want to go through and fast forward to an important section that maybe you want to um, look over again. Um, and then again, our, our business consultants will be reaching out to um, an, uh, our, our prospective new clients. Um, should you want to see our my NPS. Um, system um, and we really we really do look forward to to the opportunity of demoing um, that through to you if you've got any additional questions um Liza uh, our, our digital brand managers asked me to please let you know that you can send that through to webinar at healthbridge.co.za and um, so if something pops in up in your head this evening and you want to ask us uh, please feel free to send those questions um, through to us and we'll uh, we'll do our utmost best to, to answer, the, um, answer them as quickly as possible. Um, so that's, that's it from our side. Again, just big thanks for um, spending this hour with us. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Jared and from, Dr. Jared. From our side, um, thanks for having me. And just to the doctors, you know, I've been through this process. So if you have any questions, and I had my reservations as well. And I can't say it's always a piece of cake. And you might have to come up with questions that you want to ask. Um, and, and I'm happy to be brutally honest, even in terms of the hard things. So just maybe email that email address that they're giving you. And, I, and I'm happy to, I mean, I'm just, Liza, you can just share my contact details with whoever asks, um, my cell phone number and my, my email address. And I'm happy to share my experiences with pleasure. Thanks, Dr. Israel. Thank you. Yeah, oh, that's great. Thanks. Yeah, just, just from my side, thanks for joining. I hope I didn't go too fast. Sometimes uh, I get excited, but uh, yeah, appreciate the questions and comments. Great. Thank you. And good evening to everyone. Cheers. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Cheers.